really the only reason I want you guys on is for you to tell me who you're both voting for. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin <laughs> Carey. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Kevin Carey. Bro. There is a write-in. There is a write-in. Uh, line, write in uh, Kevin uh, Carey? Absolutely. He's, he's going to tip the scale in Maryland. So. <laughs> Sean and Kevin, welcome. Thank you guys for joining me. We got big things on the horizons, right? We got an election right around the corner. So I had to have you guys on so that you can tell me what to pay attention for, tell us what to look out for, give us some nuances that we may not be aware of, but uh, you know, educate us, get us up to speed on what we're doing. So thank you guys for the time. I'm glad we're doing this. Great to be with you, Teague. And again, if I forget to say it, thanks for everything you guys are doing on behalf of the hotel industry. You guys are our uh, voices in Washington, uh, eyes and ears and voices. So thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. All right, Chirag, I'm picking on you. Tell me, g- give me your quick thoughts on what's coming uh, with the election right around the corner. What's coming our way? What should we look out for? Not only because of COVID, but even prior to COVID, there is uh, a, a significant push to change how people vote, to make it easier for people to vote, and to create an opportunity for more people to have their voices heard, uh, whether that is through early voting, whether it's through absentee voting. And so now you've seen this trend Uh, In past years, the Democrats have had a tremendous operation on early voting and driving out absentee voting, and the Republicans have tried to shy away from that and really had more people uh, emphasizing election day voting. Now we're starting to see the Republicans have a robust operation in early and absentee voting as well. What? Give me some other nuances. Like, what are we seeing in the in the battlegrounds? Or uh, yeah, let's let's talk about the let's talk about polling. I know that's uh, that's something that uh, that's always particularly interesting, uh, and especially now with twenty four hour news cycles with with Twitter and with uh, Instagram and everything else, uh, we're watching elections like it's a spectator sport, and that the polling is the scoreboard uh, that we're we're watching. And at the same time, uh, we do know that the science is good. We know that it is close, but we just don't know if it's going to be exactly accurate when you're one point away, when you're within two points or three points or four points in the margin of error, you're starting to look at a, a very complicated uh, situation. So I'd, I'd caution people from from kind of hanging on to every poll. I think the ones that are interesting to me are the, the historic uh, analogs. And so 2016, you had um, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, Senator Clinton, that was up uh, by about six or seven points at this point in the race. Uh, you had President Biden that was up uh, uh, about uh, the same, a little bit more uh, at this point in the race. And now you've got Vice President Harris that's only up about two points. Every every battleground of your your six or seven key battleground states, they're within two points, and most of them are within one point. And so when you start looking at, at it from that perspective, now it's what did somebody have for breakfast that morning and did they show up to the vote? I mean, that's ultimately what it's going to come down to. And so uh, anytime you're that close, the the idea that there's a huge number of undecided voters, I don't think is really relevant. But uh, in those battleground states, it's only going to come down to several thousand voters. And so it is it is going to be that key uh, that, that we're looking at in just a few places. And that's what's going to turn the presidency. Talk to me about the House, the Congress, the yeah. Senate. What else are you gonna, what are we, what should we be looking out for there? Yeah, there's a, there's a high likelihood uh, that we're going to have a divided government. And, you know, oftentimes you get big consequential legislation when you have divided government. I think one of the challenges that we've run into recently is that every election, uh, it, it, there's no longer a cooling off period where everybody comes together. Hopefully we can get back to that. But it looks like, uh, at least in the in the Senate right now, the Republicans seem to have the edge. Uh, they they have, um, out of the 34 seats that are up, uh, they, they had... Uh, about 10 to defend. And it looks like uh, most of those are going to come across. There's there's always an open question. It looks like the Democrats are trying to expand the field into Texas and, and Florida. Uh, but it looks like the Republicans will have uh, at least one guaranteed in, in West Virginia. That's where the, the trend lines are going. Montana looks like it's trending towards the Republicans. And then there are a few others that we're looking closely at. Uh, Ohio is one, uh, but Senator Brown in Ohio has been a stalwart. He seems to, to win year over year. Uh, so that one may be uh, close, irrespective of sort of uh, how the top of the ticket does with uh, with President Trump in Ohio, who's winning by eight or nine points. And so we're watching that closely in the in the House. You have about 30, 32 seats uh, that are toss up seats right now. And the Republicans have a, a four seat majority it's the smallest majority in the history of the Republic by percentage. And so you can't really get anything done. That's the frustrating thing. When you have such a small majority, you can't get anything done. And so uh, if 
uh, there may be a coattail effect from the presidential election. So uh, if whoever wins the presidency may also then carry the House with them, and then you may have a divided government if it's Vice President Harris on the other side. If it's uh, President Trump, then maybe you have a trifecta. Uh, we were in a, a seminar the other day, uh, and some of the data we're looking at shows about a 40% chance of that happening. Uh, every day you look at the the polls and you're like, how could that possibly be? But given the way that these districts are are now aligned, that's at least uh, in the realm of possibility. And so uh, the House and the Senate are are definitely key there. I'll throw one other at you, Teague, as well. You mentioned, you know, what is our industry looking at and what are what are we concerned about for next year in particular? 2025 is going to be, as they're calling it, I didn't come up with this name. I think we need some better marketing people uh, in, in Congress, but they're calling it the Super Bowl of tax. Uh, where you're looking at about a four th uh, four trillion dollar uh, tax implication, where you've got the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from 2017, that many of those provisions are set to expire next year, and so we're watching it very closely. Whether it's corporate rates, with small business rates, uh, the, the pass through, and, and individual and family rates, these are all things that we're watching very closely because obviously our industry is organized across the board. If it's a, a four, five, six, ten percent increase, that's going to have a dramatic impact. Uh, bonus depreciation, the like kind exchange, things that really affect the real estate industry as well. Uh, these are very particular uh, issues. Most members of Congress don't really have an appreciation for what our industry is all about because they've never had to do that job. And so that's why it's so critical that we have to go in and educate them on this because otherwise there could be a huge tax hike uh, waiting for us at the end of next year. Kevin, I'm bringing you in, but Kevin, talk to me about any policy specifics, whether it's candidate to candidate or just macro policies that we should be watching out for slash pulling for that are going to specifically help the hotel industry? Yeah, I'll touch on a couple of the state ones and, and ask Sharag to, to weigh in on at the federal level. But uh, the the increasing uh, instances of hotel only ordinances um, and, and the pain and damage that can do to our industry from a profitability standpoint, uh, uh, ensuring that we're working to, to represent this industry uh, and to oppose those issues uh, and, and certainly watching out for where you have copycat examples of an issue jumping from one state to another. So uh, those can impact profitability in terms of daily cleaning and housekeeping, uh, as well as, as the use of subcontractors as well. So all of those issues, whether they're playing themselves out in New York City, Boston, uh, Arizona, and elsewhere are the ones uh, our team are working actively uh, to ensure they're working to oppose. Wait, be specific. What is the hotel only for those of us that don't know? Uh, when uh, pu public policy or legislation or a local ordinance is targeting one industry, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's what we're uh, uh, focused on. Give me some other examples of those things that are, I don't know, keeping you up at night. Certainly these issues uh, and how they're playing out in major markets around the U.S., uh, whether it's on the West Coast, as we saw in L.A., uh, in the surrounding uh, communities in 2023, uh, and as we got into 2024 here, uh, issues that we've talked about in the past, Teague, in, in Boston with creating an independent panel uh, to create workplace standards, uh, and, and certainly the, the New York, uh, uh, quote-unquote, Safe Hotels Act uh, that, that we've been working on aggressively. Yeah, again, you guys are doing a lot. Even back in COVID, it was sort of stay safe, helping the, the brands with sort of that and getting everybody there. And now it's, you know, continuing the policies that help guests feel comfortable, uh, but also helping owners, helping the workforce. Um, I don't know. Are, are there any workforce issues we should be aware of? Labor issues is what I'm really thinking. On the labor side, it's it's going to be uh, a very unique set of circumstances depending on who wins. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, actually get, dating back to uh, two, three administrations ago, the pendulum swings back and forth. And that's one of the things that we as an industry have to continue to deal with. And one of the biggest challenges is, of course, for business, uncertainty. And we run into that uncertainty with, with uh, frequency, particularly from policies that come from the federal level. Uh, we're seeing this with a joint employer liability, as Kevin mentioned, that pendulum swung back and forth from the Obama administration administration to the Trump administration, back to the Biden administration. Uh, we hopefully are in a good place with uh, joint employer liability, where now you can identify who exactly is the employer for, uh, for collective bargaining purposes, for benefits purposes, for a variety of very specific things uh, based on this uh, court decision that came out from uh, federal court in Texas. Hopefully that has uh, put this to bed, but now what we'll likely see is a change in tact. If, uh, it's, if it's Vice President Harris that be, it becomes president in her administration, there may be some uh, similar types of policies that come out from, from that administration. She has uh, uh, stated recently she's uh, committed to following similar ideas uh, that the, the Biden administration 
administration came out with similar uh, to, to the overtime rule, uh, which came out of the Department of Labor. Uh, on the other side of that equation, though, as it uh, pertains to workforce, you also have an immigration policy that's uh, that is one that uh, seeks to bring more people into the country. And so in that circumstance, that can certainly benefit us. We continue to have a critical workforce shortage. And so there, there's an opportunity for our industry, whether it's more guest workers through the H2B program uh, or just a, a, a wider and more uh, more opportunity for immigration. Uh, that could certainly be beneficial. On the flip side, with uh, with a potential Trump administration, you're going to have uh, what will likely be a more bu business friendly labor policy where you don't run into things like joint employer or certain other regulations that come down. But there may be a more restrictive immigration policy and that that may impact travel and tourism as well as the workforce. And so uh, we've got uh, uh, some irons in the fire on either side, both positive and and uh, perhaps challenges that may may arise. All right. That's interesting. Uh, very interesting. H how about on the sort of revenue side? And I'm thinking w visas like travel visas for, uh, for the major metros for tourism and the like. Anything on the horizon there? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest challenge we have with travel visas is the backlog. There is a huge backlog that continues and there's there's been a lot of discussion about how do you, you know, uh, provide more resources for it. It's certainly gotten better, but it becomes uh, it, it's become a huge challenge. Uh, coming out of COVID, it has uh, that, that backlog remained. There were some structural challenges or a variety of other issues there. Hopefully uh, we're gonna be able to move forward, especially when you have huge events that are coming to the United States, like the Olympics, like the World Cup, other things like that. And, and that's to say nothing of uh, just the, the average uh, day-to-day -day business. And so uh, we know that visas will remain a huge challenge. Uh, Kevin, again, again, how do you, how do you see this impact impacting the election impacting us as a whole? Yeah. So, so an interesting fact for you here, here, Teague, uh, uh, I recently learned that in 2024 um, will be the largest election year in history worldwide. Uh, so 75 countries, the most populous countries in the world, Indonesia, India, the U.S., Mexico, uh, are all having elections. So close to 50 percent of the world's population uh, will be voting in national or regional elections in 2024. And, and as we know, uh, elections at a federal level uh, will change the landscape for the next four years, certainly uh, at the executive branch and the administration level, uh, what the agencies are doing uh, in Congress, uh, who has control. And while uh, party control on average has shortened over the last several years, um, that's a key determining factor as well. So uh, we can look at this at the range of individual policies. Shirag's touched on many of them. Uh, Troy Flanagan and our state and local team uh, are actively deployed on, on a state and local addressing these issues. But if you frame it up from an industry standpoint, uh, what we're most looking at is, is how can we protect this industry's business model, whether it's franchise, um, how can we ensure that the industry has the workforce it needs in the future to meet not only current demand, but future demand, uh, but also ensuring that policies don't um, have an ill effect on the transaction market it currently uh, as well. So as we think about the business implications, all the more reason why elections are so important and why this industry needs to be telling its story in Washington, at a state and at a local level on a continuous and regular basis. And, and we work hard to ensure that we're conveying what this industry represents. It's an economic powerhouse uh, at every level in terms of job creation, economic contribution at a local level. It's also a complex industry, uh, understanding the, the dynamics uh, uh, between the ownership segment, the management companies, uh, the role the brands play, uh, that's why it's essential that we're telling the industry's story, educating elected officials so they don't put forward policies that have unintended consequences. And, and that's really uh, a key effort uh, that we're on the front end of. Uh, but we need all of our uh, industry colleagues and members to get involved, uh, whether it's through our Hotels Act grassroots, net grassroots network um, or considering uh, our hotel PAC, uh, our political action committee. All of these channels and opportunities are ones where everyone has a vested interest in this industry's future success. Uh, and we need to partner with our industry colleagues at every level in our member companies uh, to be telling that story. Yeah, again, I Echo, we appreciate everything you guys are doing. I mean, you know, listen, I, I fall under the category of, like many, I roll my eyes at the politics, you, you know, it's so divisive and you, you just kind of, and sometimes it's overwhelming, and it's confusing and you don't really know uh, the nuances of which policies are going to help and which ones aren't. There's yin and yang. Uh, we all have opinions. They are what they are. But we need somebody out there fighting for us. So I appreciate yeah. you guys fighting the fight so I can go work on selling hotels uh, <laughs> and running a business.
Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for doing all you're doing for the industry. Uh, it matters. I know this stuff matters, Kevin. I'm 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 echoing what you're saying. I'm feeling it. Yeah. I'm feeling what you're saying. So uh everybody get out there and vote and uh see you at the polls. Sounds great. Thanks, Thanks guys. Steve. Thanks, okay. Dave. Appreciate you.